Hey everyone, this is Ben Norton, and you are listening to, or perhaps watching, Moderate Rebels. I gave a talk on the fake left, if you will. There's been a lot of discussion recently. You might have seen that the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, the coup plotters and assassins and torturers at the CIA, released an ad promoting intersectional feminism and they had a Latina woman talk about why she's an intersectional feminist and why she supports working at the CIA and did spoken word poetry, basically. I'm a woman of color. I am a mom. I am a cisgender millennial who's been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. I am intersectional, but my existence is not a box checking exercise. I did not sneak into CIA. My employment was not and is not the result of a fluke or slip through the cracks. I earned my way in and I earned my way up the ranks of this organization. I used to struggle with imposter syndrome, but at 36, I refused to internalize misguided patriarchal ideas of what a woman can or should be. I am tired of feeling like I'm supposed to apologize for the space I occupy rather than intoxicate people with my effort, my brilliance. I stand here today a proud first-generation Latina and officer at CIA. And there was another video as part of the so-called Humans of the CIA series, and they promoted a, a gay man from the South in the United States and also a black woman, and it's part of their strategy of intersectional imperialism, right, of cultivating this, this fake left that is pro-imperialist and you exploits superficial versions of anti-racism and feminism that actually are often deeply racist and misogynist in order to support imperialism and support deeply destructive institutions like the CIA. My favorite thing about CIA is that they encourage the out-of-the-box ideas that drive real progress. Growing up gay in a small southern town, I was lucky to have a wonderful and accepting family. I always struggled with the idea that I might not be able to discuss my personal life at work. Imagine my surprise when I was taking my oath at CIA and I noticed a rainbow on then-director Brennan's lanyard, which I later learned was designed by Engel, one of the many employee resource groups here at the agency. I remember being stunned. Since then, however, I've learned that far beyond the resource groups, inclusion is a core value here. Officers from the top down work hard to ensure that every single person, whatever their gender, gender identity, race, disability, or sexual orientation can bring their entire self to work every day. I joined CIA almost straight out of college when it can be a challenge to speak up when you're younger and adjusting to workplace norms, especially in such a unique environment. Then adding to that are the social challenges both women and people of color face, so it really just became a balancing act from there. I struggled to feel included, but I was lucky to have a senior analyst recognize others' sometimes exclusive behavior. And as an ally and genuine mentor, she encouraged me to pursue new opportunities. And every day I feel more empowered to speak up. It is not enough to just say that CIA values people from diverse backgrounds and diverse abilities. We have to challenge ourselves and commit to regularly questioning how do our actions actually embody those values? In many ways, I think CIA is a microcosm of the world. The same societal issues that we grapple with outside of these walls don't just cease to exist once we enter the building. What is critical and what gives me optimism that we are moving in the right direction is that there are people here who recognize that and are holding CIA as an institution accountable for the diversity and inclusion that it champions. So in this talk, I was invited to speak about the history going back to the first Cold War of the cultivation of the so-called fake left. I talked about the roots in the cultural Cold War and the CIA's covert operations and big billionaire funded foundations. I talked about how the strategy was used in the United States and Western Europe, but it's also been exported to countries in Latin America. For those interested, I did a talk recently here at Moderate Rebels about the situation in Ecuador, which is a case study for the construction of this fake left. Also Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, there are many examples of it. So without further ado, this is a long talk, but I really hope that you can learn a lot revisiting some of this history that I think is really important to understand today how this fake left has been constructed, and especially now with the new Cold War just going full steam ahead, 
I think it's going to be very important to understand the strategies of counterinsurgency, because that's what it is. This is counterinsurgency waged by the U.S. national security state with its backers on Wall Street, a finance capital, and big tech in Silicon Valley against the left. You can call the new, new left, right? To prevent a progressive, socialist, and anti-imperialist revolutionary movement from emerging, not just around the world, but especially in the United States. Thank you so much for listening. Here's my talk. I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. I, today, of course, will be talking about this idea of the fake left. Some people refer to it as the synthetic left. You could also just call it the social chauvinist left if you go back 100 years to what Lenin was writing about the kind of pro-imperialist social democratic left. And it wasn't just Lenin. I mean, this was during World War I in which the international socialist movement split and there was the faction that became the communists who were against the inter-imperialist war of World War I that included Lenin, but also it included Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg who were actually killed at the hands of the former leftists who had supported World War I, specifically from the Social Democratic Party of Germany. And they allied actually with Noska, the bloodhound, the German defense minister who used the proto-fascist Freikorps, which were the kind of seeds that became the Nazi party and, and the SS and the, the brown shirts. So, you know, this, this history goes back well over 100 years, and it's important to understand the historical echoes there. And 100 years ago, the kind of fake left was referred to with that term, social chauvinism. And I think in many ways today, it's a similar phenomenon, but it's a little more complex because we're not in a World War I-like scenario, although we are in a new Cold War, which we'll talk about. And the fake left figures are not necessarily supporting chauvinism in the classical sense. They're not talking about how great American democracy is or British democracy or French democracy is. Most of them are smart enough to realize that that kind of old school blunt chauvinism is, is not a progressive uh, view. But I'm going to focus more on how this fake left has been sustained materially and how it actually functions in an ecosystem of NGOs, foundations, academia, and the media. Because when we, when we do an analysis of how this works, we have to do a materialist analysis. So frequently, and I've been guilty of this at times, we speak in generalities. And this is especially true on social media, which encourages speaking very vaguely in generalities about the Western left, the fake left, or on the alternate side, you have these figures who have been trying to repopularize this term tanky. And tanky means anything. Tanky could mean, you know, uh, going back to old school Marxist-Leninists and the Bolshevik party. Tankies could also just mean Angela Davis. Tankies could mean the Black Panther Party. Tankies could mean the IRA. I mean, tanky means nothing. And in fact, what it really means these days especially when it's used even by liberal figures who write for the mainstream corporate media, tanky really means an anti-imperialist, and especially an anti-imperialist from the global south. So to them, every you know socialist and anti-imperialist leader, Ho Chi Minh was a tanky, or in Burkina Faso, the, the communist movement there, was, we're, all, we're all tankies. I mean, or the Sandinista party, tankies, or the Venezuelan Chavistas, tankies. I mean, it's, it's really ridiculous. So how is that ideological movement sustained? I mean, we can talk, we can make fun of it, but just understanding it from an, ide an idealist perspective as opposed to a materialist perspective doesn't understand how this form of the fake left, the synthetic left, the social chauvinist left actually propagates itself. The reality is that there is a lot of money flowing into promoting this ideology. And if we're going to do a materialist analysis, we have to understand 
follow the money, basically. I mean, as a journalist, that's what you often say. But for people interested in an actual Marxist materialist analysis, we have to understand that this was part of an ideological and political project going back to the first Cold War. And I'm going to begin this talk today looking at some quotes from what I think is one of the most important books written in the past several decades, which is called The Cultural Cold War. And I'll get to that in a second. But we have to understand that during the first Cold War, which you could say, of course, was roughly 1945 until 1991, this is a war on socialism internationally. Of course, the Soviet Union at that time was the leader of the global socialist movement, the most powerful socialist country, but in 1949, there's a revolution in China. In the decades following, there's a revolution in Korea, Vietnam, Cuba, eventually Nicaragua. There was a similar process in Chile, throughout Africa, including the Congo. I, mean, I wouldn't necessarily call it a socialist revolution, but this is the, the peak of the national liberation struggles, and most of the national liberation leaders were significantly left-leaning, if not socialist, and some communist in the case of the Vietnamese, the Koreans. In the case of Congo and Patrice Lumumba, this is a progressive movement against Belgian colonialism, and of course the CIA, at the orders of Eisenhower, one of the last orders that he makes, it, they are ordered to assassinate Patrice Lumumba, and Belgian intelligence helps kill this very important national liberation leader. In the case of the Indonesian Communist Party, which was the largest communist party outside of China, which of course had a communist government after 1949, the Indonesian Communist Party was liquidated in a genocidal extermination campaign, once again backed by the CIA in 1965 and 1966. The famous coup, the CIA coup in Chile against Salvador Allende on September 11th, 1973, is, is pretty well known by people on the left. Salvador Allende was a democratically elected Marxist president. He decided that he was going to try to take a path working through bourgeois democracy, making an alliance with other left-wing parties, including the socialists. And he did come to power, and immediately the U.S. government imposed a kind of de facto blockade and sanctions, and Richard Nixon, the U.S. president, declared, make the economy scream, which is an, an early example of what we're seeing today of this strategy of trying to suffocate any independent, anti-imperialist, progressive, and especially socialist country with the blockade of Cuba, with the blockade of Venezuela, with sanctions on Nicaragua, with sanctions on China and Russia and Iran and Zimbabwe and so many countries. In fact, right now, between one-third and one-fourth of the global population lives in countries suffering under U.S. sanctions, which are totally illegal under international law. Well, this strategy has its seeds going back to the 1960s to make the economy scream, as Richard Nixon said. Well, getting back to Indonesia... That is not nearly as well known. The CIA helped overthrow a progressive socialist president who was an ally of the Communist Party, which was, again, the largest communist party in Asia outside of China. And his name was Sukarno, and he was overthrown in a U.S.-backed coup by a military general named Suharto, who proceeded to exterminate over a million communists, left-wing sympathizers, trade organizers, and by the way, ethnic Chinese, because ethnic Chinese in Indonesia were associated with being communist. So there was even a traditional element of genocide in that, similar to, you could say, the Armenian genocide carried out by the Ottoman Empire, which was a genocide against Christians, but specifically Armenians and Greek Orthodox being the main kind of Christians, Assyrians as well. So there's historical parallels there in Indonesia. And the CIA was deeply involved not only backing and helping to orchestrate this coup and the genocide, but also the CIA through the U.S. Embassy, which, surprise, surprise, U.S. Embassies are not neutral institutions. They're often arms of the CIA, and the State Department and CIA work very closely together. The CIA and, and U.S. Embassy were handing out lists to the Indonesian generals, these fascists, to, of, with names of communists and left-wing sympathizers to murder. That history is extremely bloody. But we have to understand that that history of containment, of imperial slaughter, 
of the three million Koreans killed in the Korean War, of the three million Vietnamese killed, of the hundreds of thousands killed in Cambodia, hundreds of thousands more in Laos, during the U.S. scorched earth wars on Southeast Asia. These were, this, for them, that wasn't a cold war. It was a very hot war. It was a genocidal war in which millions and millions of people were killed as part of the U.S.-led campaign as the leader of international capitalism and imperialism to destroy any socialist alternative to capitalism and imperialism. And we can't, we can't forget that the wars in Southeast Asia were, were happening specifically because the U.S., in, in the terms of its own imperial strategist, lost China, as they said, because apparently China was the, the personal colonial property of the U.S. empire, and that became a huge scandal, especially in the Eisenhower years, of who lost China, as they said it. So, of course, the wars in Southeast Asia were wars to prevent socialism from actually being able to succeed and to spread after the U.S. was unable to crush the this communists in Korea after killing 20% of the North Korean population and destroying 80% of the buildings in all of the country in the north of Korea. And, of course, with the Soviet Union still in power and at that time allied with China. So... We have to understand that at around that time, the U.S. began cultivating another strategy, which you could call the Cultural Cold War, because while the U.S. empire is waging these wars around the world, with the help, of course, of Western European powers, but NATO being the main instrument of U.S. imperial control exercised throughout the world as a military alliance, and, of course, Western European powers being part of NATO, NATO being kind of the main instrument of imperialism still today. And, of course, we can talk about how NATO rehabilitated Nazis after World War II and all of this, but I, I don't want to get too distracted because I could talk about that for the entire talk. Now I'm going to hone in more on the cultural element. Well, I don't really like that term, but I use, I use that term because that's the name of the book, The Cultural Cold War. Because while the U.S. is waging this war abroad, and while these Western... European capitalist countries are doing similar operations abroad, especially the British. At home, they're doing counterinsurgency campaigns. And it's, it's not, there's not some neat division between what the imperialist governments are doing abroad and what they're doing at home. There's a lot of overlaps. And of course, the U.S. government and the British government will claim that it's illegal for the CIA or MI6 to operate domestically. But they do it. Surprise. I hope it's not a surprise to anyone. Of course they do it domestically. And they do it through front groups. And they do it through NGOs. And they do it through foundations. And they do it through the media. So anyone who's interested can look into writing on Operation Mockingbird. And just, I mean, it was kind of a what was called a so-called limited hangout. But Rolling Stone published a piece by a legendary... Washington, former Washington Post reporter, Bernstein, who got a list of hundreds of journalists who were working for the CIA at this time, at the, the height of the Cold War in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and media outlets we know that were funded by the CIA. But what were they doing? They were dedicated to supporting a fake left. Because this is what I'm talking about. We have to understand the material basis for, for astroturfing this fake left. And now I'm going to try to share my screen here and go back to this book, The Cultural Cold War, because I'm just going to read a few passages here, and I would highly recommend, let me see if I can get, all right, so this is the book, The Cultural Cold War, and again, I would highly recommend reading this book. It's by Francis Stoner Saunders, who I believe was actually an arts and entertainment editor at the New Statesman, which is ironically a great example of this kind of astroturfed fake left. But I, I believe it was in, in the UK, it was published under the name of Who Pied the Piper. But in the United States, it was published under the name The Cultural Cold War. And the subtitle is The CIA and the World of Arts and Letters. Now, this was published in 1999, but everything that, that it talks about is still very relevant today. And 
especially this chapter here, you can see there are several chapters focusing on music and, and artists, and it discusses, for instance, some of the most famous writers and novelists and composers and musicians and painters were all supported by the CIA, including Pollock, the famous splatter paint artist, including many composers like Leonard Bernstein, I mean a brilliant composer, including famous jazz musicians, and there, there's a whole host of artists and intellectuals. We now know that French postmodern philosophy, these, these kinds of anti-Marxist, or often called post-Marxist, I would call mostly anti-Marxist, postmodern French philosophers, they were also promoted by the CIA. And there's a brilliant scholar named Gabriel Rockhill, who's a French-American scholar, who has documented the CIA's support for French anti-communist philosophers, but and especially the so-called new philosophers. And by the way, it's not a coincidence when we're talking about the fake left, and there's also a history of these the, the pipeline between Trotskyism and neoconservatism in the United States. Well, there's something very similar in France of the nouveau philosophe, the French, the new philosophers, who all became neoconservatives as well. So Henri Lévy is a great example of that, BHL, and there's others who are now key figures who supported the Iraq War, who are supporting the new Cold War on China, and they have their origins in, in the so-called French New Left and as part of this postmodern anti-Marxist movement. But for us today, the chapter I want to really focus on is called the Consortium, because this, and there's also stuff on NATO and Argentina and Latin America, but the chapter on what's called the Consortium is extremely important to understand the world we're living in today. And I'm just going to read a few passages from this. So she writes that cultural freedom did not come cheap. Over the next 17 years, she's talking about the during the first Cold War, so this is in the 50s and 60s and 70s, the CIA was to pump tens of millions of dollars into the Congress for Cultural Freedom and related projects. With this kind of commitment, the CIA was in effect acting as America's Ministry of Culture. Now this is important because in Europe, you all are used to having a Ministry of Culture in many countries, depends on the country of course, but that kind of openly funds art programs and things like that. In the United States, there, there is not something commensurate to that. There's not a ministry of culture. And what she's saying is, you know, true, the CIA played that de facto role, but of course, what it was supporting, it was supporting anti-communist work and propaganda, but it was progressive anti-communism. So one of the most, she names this thing here, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. The Congress for Cultural Freedom was set up the beginning of the Cold War, and it was closed at, during the, the, the rise of neoliberalism under Ronald Reagan in 1979, and of course the rise of Margaret Thatcher, and that's toward the end of the Cold War. And the cultural cold freedom was not actually supporting what you could say is very explicitly right-wing and conservative groups. The, ma the vast majority of the groups that received support from the Congress of C for Cultural Freedom were progressive groups, feminist groups, anti-racist groups, and LGBT groups. You know, these kind of liberal groups who certainly sometimes do good and important work, but they're being supported because the CIA and the U.S. government and what you could call the national security state is cultivating this kind of respectable pro-imperialist fake left, synthetic left that will support its foreign policy interests Well, this is important, domestically, the U.S. government can claim that it's actually a progressive force, that it's not a reactionary force like it's portrayed in communist propaganda in the, in the Soviet agitprop, which portrays it, you know, these, these famous Soviet propaganda posters, which are very powerful, of like these U.S. cops with like Klan hoods, like KKK hoods, like murdering black people and lynching black people. Of course, that was actually happening throughout up until the 1960s. But of course, the U.S. was supporting the CIA was cultivating this, these efforts to portray itself as progressive. And in fact, it was pressure from the Soviet Union during the Cold War that forced the, the U.S. government to desegregate the U.S. military. And it was the Soviet Union and the international communist movement that pressured the U.S. to agree to the Civil Rights Act. 
And of course, I'm not downplaying the importance of the organizing on the ground in the United States and the, the civil rights movement and the people who sacrificed their lives and their, their safety. A lot of people, thousands of people, but at the same time, it's give and take. That pressure is happening inside, and then externally, the U.S. is is facing this pressure because of the Cold War and has to agree to some liberal and even social democratic reforms. So it's not a coincidence that the peak of the kind of so-called golden era of European social democracy and American liberalism is the same time period of the 50s and 60s and 70s. It's since 1978 that in the United States, median income has been totally static since 1978. But before that, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, income was actually rising, labor unions were strong, and there were these progressive civil rights movements and, liberal, and feminist movements and LGBT movements that were gaining power, partially because the US capitalist class, and this is true with the welfare state in, in Western Europe, the capitalist class feared a socialist revolution. Socialism was spreading throughout the world, especially not just in the Soviet Union and China, but especially throughout the global south. And, you know, I mentioned that most of the national liberation leaders identified as socialists in some way. Even in India, the Congress party, which today is largely a neoliberal party, but the Indian National Congress explicitly called itself a socialist party. They wrote socialism into the Indian constitution, which has been totally undone since the neoliberal era and now with the rise of the far-right BJP party. But the point is that this is, this is a time of foment around the world and revolutionary movements. And because of that external pressure combined with the domestic pressure, the US and Western European capitalist classes are forced to make these concessions. And the cultural Cold War and the Congress for Cultural Freedom is encouraging progressive groups. So one of the most famous beneficiaries of the Congress for Cultural Freedom is Gloria Steinem. If you don't know in Ireland who that is, she, you, you can look her up. She's one of the most famous American feminists, a very close ally of Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party, and kind of the, the, the godmother of the second wave of feminism. And she was a direct beneficiary. In fact, not only did she work with the Congress for Cultural Freedom and, and support anti-communist efforts, she was a literal CIA agent. There's a video you can find online posted by Corey Morningstar, who is a brilliant researcher who focuses on the fake left and environmentalism and greenwashing of imperialism. And Corey Morningstar found this archival footage of Gloria Steinem, the godmother of American feminism, admitting that she worked for the CIA. And in her words, the CIA was very progressive, she said, very progressive. So again, this is getting back to the CIA and the national security state and imperialism and the, and the capitalist class. They don't need to, to manufacture consent for the right. They already have the support of the right. You don't need to convince conservatives to support an imperialist war. You have to convince as part of the so-called left. That is why so much of this effort is not dedicated to supporting the right. I mean, of course, the CIA around the world is supporting far-right groups through Operation Gladio, supporting former Nazis in the Stay Behind program in Western Europe, supporting fascists throughout the global south, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia. But at home, they're supporting these liberal groups, which they can weaponize against the anti-imperialist and socialist and communist left. So anyway, I'm going to read a few more things here. This is really important to understand that the reason this chapter here is called the consortium is because she's talking about the apparatus that was constructed during the first Cold War, which today still funds and bolsters and sustains the, the fake left in the United States and Western Europe and other countries increasingly. So she talks about how the CIA worked to create an ecosystem, a group of so-called private groups or friends into an unofficial consortium. This was an entrepreneurial coalition of philanthropic foundations, and foundations are very, very important in this business corporations and other institutions who worked hand in hand with the CIA to provide the cover and the funding pipeline for its secret programs in Western Europe and the United States. 
So they acted as the CIA's designated Cold War venture capitalists. And of course, behind all of this is Alan Dulles, the godfather of the American deep state, the American national security state, who created the CIA out of the OSS after World War II. And let's not forget, what was Alan Dulles' class position and his background? He was a lawyer for Wall Street. The CIA has always been the organized criminal arm of finance capital. The CIA comes directly out of Wall Street using the power of the American state and the national security apparatus, but acting on the interest of American financial capital from Wall Street. It was founded and run by, originally, at least the first generation, was founded and run by Wall Street men, by lawyers like Alan Dulles, and then later, it was oil men, like George H.W. Bush, who comes out of the Texas, I mean, actually, he comes from the Northeast, even though he later, the Bush family later tried to rebrand as from the South with their fake accent and stuff, but they were blue-blooded wasps from the Northeast, from Connecticut, and they moved to Texas to work with the CIA and specifically the oil industry. So Alan Dulles, the Bushes, so many other figures, Bill Donovan, all of these figures who were involved in creating the CIA, they're explicitly acting on behalf of finance capital. So, and then his brother, John Foster Dulles, who was Secretary of State, and the two of them were extremely important. In 1949, this is the beginning of the, the first Cold War, Alan Dulles created the National Committee for a Free Europe. It was ostensibly a group of private American citizens dedicated to co combating so-called communist, the so-called communist threat, but in reality, it was one of the CIA's most ambitious fronts. It operated solely at the discretion of the CIA, which provided 90% of financial support through unvouchered funds. So we have to understand that this is the apparatus that's being built up, and it begins targeting Western Europe and the Western European left. Now, what was the CIA's first operation ever? After the CIA was created, the first operation was stealing, rigging the 1948 election in Italy to steal it from the communists because the communist party and communist partisans were the main force of resistance against the fascists during World War II. So naturally, after World War II, the communists were very popular and in, in cities like Bologna, the communists governed until the end of the first Cold War, up until the 1980s. And the communist party remained very powerful throughout that time. And in 1948, if it weren't for the CIA meddling, rigging the vote, and handing out millions of dollars in, in bags and in sacks of money, like a cartoon, to right-wing forces bribing the Catholic Church to actually excommunicate the, the Italian communists, which was a huge, hugely important factor in a very religious Catholic country like Italy, that was the main reason the, the communists, in coalition with the socialists, lost the 1948 election in Italy. That could have totally shifted the hit modern history of Western Europe. Because this is also the time when the Soviet Union is supporting these parties, like the French Communist Party and the Italian Communist Party, working within bourgeois democracy because they thought they might be able to win. Unfortunately, they underestimated just how nefarious U.S. imperialism was and just how much it would meddle and try to manipulate and control Western European so-called bourgeois democracy. Of course, the same thing happened in France after World War II. The Communist Party was extremely powerful. So... Moving to the CIA in 1950, Alan Dulles became the great white case officer of the, the National Committee for Free Europe. The National Committee for Free Europe served as the paradigm for the CIA-led corporatization of the foreign policy machinery in the Cold War period. And she points out who was involved, including the president of General Motors and people from foundations and part of the Museum of Modern Art and film director, directors and journalists, very important journalists were involved and trade unionists were involved. And we can talk about how the trade unions supported by the CIA and intelligence services have played a ro role in cultivating the fake left. And then this, 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 laid, this brings us to the Free Europe Committee, and it brings us to the creation of the US government's propaganda arm, Radio Free Europe, which was originally founded, which she doesn't mention, as Radio Liberation from Bolshevism, before, you know, they, they kind of realized that's a little too on point. Maybe it should be a slightly more subtle. So Radio Free Europe became the name, and they began spreading propaganda. Radio Free Europe was created by the CIA, and still today, 
It, it later merged with Radio Liberty, so R-F-E-R-L, is still very active today, supporting the coup attempt in Belarus, they're very active there, anti-Russian propaganda throughout Europe, and they spread to other parts of the world. So, and then it talks about the fundraising arm was created, the Crusade for Freedom, which named a young actor, Ronald Reagan, as the leading spokesman and publicist. It's important that Reagan was an actor and was working with the CIA front groups back when he, even before he entered politics, because what happens is that this apparatus cultivates figures. Now, he's an example of someone from the right wing who was cultivated, but Gloria Steinem is a great example of someone on the so-called left. Or another example, the figure Bayard Rustin. For people who don't know who Bayard Rustin is, he was a lesser known civil rights activist in the United States. He was a great example of one of these Trotskyites who became a neoconservative. Bayard Rustin was a Trot, and he later, he moved further and further to the right, which is very common for Trotskyites. And eventually, he became a social democrat and became part of Social Democrats USA and was one of the, one of the leaders of Social Democrats USA, which you know, is, has its origins linked to Democratic Socialists of America. And Bayard Rustin was working with the CIA. And in fact, in Latin America, he was helping to do counterinsurgency work with the CIA against anti-imperialist and communist forces in Latin America. And what's funny is the FBI was investigating Bayard Rustin. The FBI didn't know that he was a CIA asset because he claimed to be a socialist and he was going to Latin America and the FBI investigated him thinking that he was involved in supporting socialists in Latin America. In fact, he was helping the CIA do counterinsurgency against socialists in Latin America. Why? Because in his term, they were tankies and authoritarians and Stalinists. So this is the same kind of history we're talking about today that I'm going to get to in, in, a, in a little bit here. And it's important to recognize that Bayard Rustin, toward the end of his life, became a full-on neoconservative who helped create an organization that supported Zionism in the black community in the United States, that supported Israel. He also supported numerous wars, imperialist wars. I mean, he was a full-on neoconservative. So anyway, getting back to looking back at these, this institutional support, it's important to talk about that the Crusade for Freedom was used to lunder money, money to support a program run by Bill Casey, the future CIA director, called the International Refugee Committee, which coordinated the exfiltration of Nazis from Germany to the United States, where they were expected to assist the government in the struggle against communism. The International Refugee Committee also was used to weaponize re refugee, or so, not even many, most of them weren't refugees, immigrants who voluntarily left communist and socialist countries. I would highly recommend the work of the journalist Yasha Levine, who himself was born in the Soviet Union, born in the Soviet Union and then later moved and was raised in the United States. He has a brilliant project right now called Immigrants as a Weapon. And Yasha Levine is looking into this kind of apparatus and the International Refugee Committee and how, for instance, they weaponized Jewish immigrants from the Soviet Union many of whom were Zionists and went to Israel, and actually they learned how horrible Israel was, and the majority, over 90%, just ended up going to the United States because they hated Israel. And, of course, the Tibetan um, migrants, who were, many of whom were involved in the CIA-backed counterinsurgency, or insert, not counterinsurgency, the CIA insurgency operation to try to wage war against the People's Republic of China. Today, it would, the modern equivalent would be the Uyghurs, and all of these Uyghur exile groups who work closely with the U.S. government, who are funded by the U.S. government, and they're the same modern example of the weaponization of refugees and immigrants. In the case of Canada, Ukrainian immigrants, many of whom were descendants of Nazi collaborators and play a very prominent role there in, in Canadian politics. So this is the beginning of this apparatus. But this name mentioned here, Bill Casey, is extremely important because Bill Casey is the founder during the 1980s, when he's the CIA director, of the National Endowment for Democracy. So I know some of this stuff here might seem like it's a little kind of back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, so it might not seem super relevant, but it's very important because what I'm talking about is this history details the foundations of the apparatus that sustains and funds the fake left. Bill Casey's National Endowment for Democracy, around the world today, the NED, continues to fund in insurgent groups, pro-imperialist groups, 
fake left groups throughout Latin America. The NED funds fake left groups in, in, well, they used to fund them in Cuba, but they were kicked out, along with the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, which is another CIA front. The NED funds the fake left here in Nicaragua. I live in, in Nicaragua, who participated in a, the fake left that participated in a very violent coup attempt in 2018. And many of those groups were funded by the NID, NED, again, fun, founded by Bill Casey, Reagan's CIA director. And I, I'll talk more about the CIA later. I mean, the NED, which is basically the CIA, later. So anyway, uh, here's a, an interesting quote from a CIA case officer who was involved in this, Henry Breck. He said, of course, if you're in a real war, you must fight hard, and the upper classes fight the hardest. They have the most to lose. So this is the beginning of creating this apparatus, and then now we get into foundations, and this is going to help us explain, understand the fake left and how it's sustained today. Foundations are the main instrument of financial support for most of these fake left groups, and I'm not saying that, the, 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 for instance, even during this period, most of these groups were not funded directly by the CIA. Rather, the CIA used foundations as cover in order to fund fake, group, fake left groups. So this gets into 1956, and there's J.M. Kaplan, who, once again, we see the ties between capital and private cap individual capitalists and the CIA. So the CIA, co I mean, again, I need to stress this point. The CIA is capitalism's invisible army. It's, it's, it's explicitly an arm of capital, and it, what it does is it basically creates these kind of private militias for capital, for individual capitalists, and uses their money to help fund its operations. So J.M. Kaplan, who was, he was a very wealthy, very, very wealthy millionaire at that time, and he had $14 million in his foundation at that time in 1956, which is hundreds of millions of dollars today, right, adjusted for inflation. And J.M. Kaplan got his wealth from the Grape Juice Company. He also funded a lot of other, he was, he was a cra genuinely crazy man. Like a lot of these capitalists, I mean, look at Jeff Bezos. I mean, these people are psychos. They, they, they're like, or Peter Thiel, who like apparently, according to some media articles, this guy is interested in like blood transfusions. He's like basically a vampire to try to stay young. These people are, when you have over a billion dollars, you just become a total psycho. But anyway, so J.M. Kaplan helps create the Kaplan Foundation. He wrote to Alan Dulles, the godfather of the CIA and the American Deep State, offering his services in the fight against communism. And he said he offered to devote his unending and unending energy to utilize every idea and ingenuity to overriding aim of working out or whatever, to, of breaking up every communist conspiracy, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they made a foundation and the Kaplan Foundation could soon be counted as a CIA asset, a reliable pass-through for secret funds earmarked for CIA projects. That term pass-through is extremely important. What a pass-through means, and today there are similar foundations like the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Open Society Foundations of a billionaire whose name you're never allowed to mention. I'll whisper it here. <gasps> George Soros. Woo! Did it, did, oh no, George Soros. I mean, clearly the right wing is, they have an obsessive, anti-Semitic kind of, you know, scapegoating of George Soros. And that's true. I'm not, I'm, of course, we should oppose the kind of anti-Semitic scapegoating. But at the same time, George Soros has a very long history of working with the CIA front groups and his foundation, which has billions of dollars in assets, the Open Society Foundation, is one of the main pass-throughs focused more on Europe than on the United States, but it funds so many of these fake left groups and these so-called progressive groups that are all pro-imperialist and anti-communist. And then this, this line is very important from the book here. The use of philanthropic foundations was the most convenient way to pass large sums of money to CIA projects without alerting the recipients of their source. By the mid-1950s, the CIA's intrusion into the foundation field was massive. Now, there's an important qualifier here. Many of the recipients didn't even know that they were getting money from the CIA. This is important. Gloria Steinem knew she was working for the CIA. And when we see her endorsing Hillary Clinton on stage with, you know, this, this incredible war hawk who, after killing 
Muammar Gaddafi, the president of Libya, in this horrible bloodbath from Salafi jihadist extremists who, you know, they killed him with a bayonet. They sodomized him with a bayonet. And then Hillary Clinton on TV says, we came, we saw he died, yay! I mean, total, again, total sociopath. I mean, a lot of these people are total sociopaths. We can't, we can't under, I mean, part of our materialist al analysis of history is also understanding that, like, the ruling class is full of these deranged figures who are genuine sociopaths. But, but anyway, Gloria Steinem is, was an exception. The majority of the figures during this period did not know they were receiving CIA money. So there's a, a host of many literary magazines and left-wing magazines. The most famous is a, an anti-communist magazine called Partisan Review. Partisan Review was founded originally as a socialist magazine that supported the Soviet Union and throughout World War II supported the Soviet Union, even under the leadership when, of Stalin at the time. I mean, let's not forget that the Soviet Union under the leadership of Stalin was also allied with the U.S. and the U.K. during World War II. So it was not it was not uncommon, but after during the beginning of the first Cold War, the CIA started funding so-called left-wing journals like the Partisan Review, and then they had a shift in editorial stance and they became die-hard anti-communists. So I think a lot of the people working there didn't know they were receiving CIA money, and I wouldn't be surprised today if some social democratic journals and magazines that are very popular among the the anti-communist pro-imperialist left, I would not be surprised in any way if they were also receiving money through similar pass-throughs through foundations and they didn't realize that it's, found, that it's intelligence money. I'm not accusing them of knowingly taking intelligence money. I'm saying that it, it's, it's very possible. So anyway, going forward, so it says, unlike the power of corporate management, this would be unchecked by stockholders. Unlike the power of government, it is unchecked by the people. Unlike the power of churches, it is unchecked by any firmly established canons of value. So this is, is explaining why the so-called consortium here, this private CIA apparatus that was constructed is very powerful because if there is a, a, an information request, so a public records request, in the United States it's called a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, it's, has a very similar acronym throughout other countries. If journalists, the very few, want to investigate this, they often won't find information on it because it's being done privately through the CIA, through its black budget, being funded by billionaire capitalists, oligarchs. And then, of course, because it's not done through a big corporation, you don't have the same paper trail. If you do it through a big foundation, especially a pass-through like the Ford Foundation or Rockefeller or Tides Foundation, what you can do is it, it's, it works the same way that dark money works. Dark money in the term, in the United States at least, is used to refer to how billionaires and these big companies will send money to a foundation called a dark money group that has usually foundation legal status, and then that group sends the money to a politician to fund their political campaign, and that way, the, the, for instance, the Koch brothers, some of the rich, well, one of them's dead now, but the Koch brothers can fund, with their billions and billions of dollars in wealth, can fund ultra white right wing politicians, but they can say, but those politicians can say, I don't have Koch money, prove it. And it's hard to prove because it goes through a foundation pass through, which are, when it's, when the Koch brothers do it, it's called dark money, which is, I mean, it should be called dark money, but when the CIA does it, it's called democracy promotion, yay, or it's called supporting whatever, civil rights or feminism or whatever. So it's the same, pro pro same concept. So then she goes on and says, CIA funding was involved in nearly half of the grants made by 164 foundations in the field of international activities. This is so important. She did an analysis of looking, looking at all of these grants at 164 foundations and found that CIA funding was involved in nearly half of the grants. And what is it focused on? International activities, imperialism. So we need to understand that, that intelligence is deeply linked in supporting. So when you see a group funded by the Ford Foundation or Rockefeller Foundation or Open Society and they focus on Russia or China or Latin America or whatever, that's extremely suspicious, extremely suspicious. And what she says, bona fide foundations 
such as Ford, Rockefeller, and Carnegie were considered the best and most plausible kind of funding cover. It allowed the CIA to fund a seemingly limitless range of covert action programs affecting youth groups, labor unions, and universities, publishing houses, and other private institutions from the early 1950s on. That still is happening today. To this day, it is happening. There was a cover branch at CIA whose job it was to help provide cover, like the foundations we used for our operations, Braden explained, who was involved in the operations. So later on, she says, she documents here, this is again, such an important book, I can't recommend it enough. She documents that known to have wittingly facilitated CIA funded passes were over 170 foundations. 170. And in addition to the big players like Ford, Rockefeller, and Carnegie, I would also add Open Society. In addition, you have these smaller foundations, the Miami District Fund, the Price Fund. I don't even know what these are, but the point is a lot of foundations. So, and this is, this is true for Europe as well. It's not just the United States, of course. In fact, when it got its start, it was focused on Western Europe, and then it began focusing more in the 1960s when the new left was rising, the new communist movement was very powerful, and the left was growing, and there were genuine fears in the United States of a revolution. The, you had the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, and a variety of other groups that were not only revolutionaries, they were armed. And the U.S. government was so afraid, of course, that the FBI ran its infamous counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO. The FBI executed communist leaders like the Chicago Black Panther chairman, Fred Hampton, also, we know it's, it's an established fact that U.S. intelligence agencies were deeply involved in the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. This is an incontrovertible fact. So later, the joke was that if any American philanthropic or cultural organization carried the word free or private in its literature, it must be a CIA front. So one example of that is the Fairfield Foundation, also the France America Society, and then of course the Rockefeller Foundation and the Rockefeller family. Again, we need to understand that the CIA being the nexus between private capital and organized crime, working together to, to use the, the wealth of private capitalists to fund the war, the international war on socialism. And of course, the, the Council on Foreign Relations, which is still a very, in, very important group that comes out of the Rockefeller family, oligarchs, the Council on Foreign Relations has a very strong influence on Western foreign policy and NATO, and of course, other prominent members, including, were included Alan Dulles and David Rockefeller. She calls it a private think tank made of America's corporate and social elite, which acted as a kind of shadow foreign policy making unit, extremely important. So. She says, the system of private patronage was the preeminent model of how small homogenous groups came to defend America's, and by definition, their own interests. Serving at the top of the pile was every self-respecting wasp's ambition. And then the prize for, was a trusteeship on either the Ford Foundation or the Rockefeller Foundation, both of which were conscious instruments of covert U.S. foreign policy with directors and officers who were closely connected to or even members of American intelligence. This is bringing us to the modern era. The Ford Foundation is one of the main funders of progressive groups in the United States and Western Europe to this day. I, and look, I'm not saying that Black Lives Matter is all a CIA plot. It's not at all. The point is that these foundations play a role of astroturfing, and the Ford Foundation has poured money into Black Lives Matter, into a lot of these Black Lives Matter affiliated NGOs. The Ford Foundation, in fact, three of the three so-called founders of Black Lives Matter, which is hilarious because Martin Luther King never called himself a founder of the civil rights movement. That is like such a neoliberal CV building, kind of, oh, I'm a founder of this massive social movement. I, coin, I, I coined the hashtag and I trademarked it. I mean, that, for me, that's such a, that's the embodiment of this neoliberal era that we're living in, where even the so-called, the fake left, you know, they use that same neoliberal marketing rhetoric and everyone has their personal brand, right? So of the three so-called founders of Black Lives Matter, all of them are funded by big foundations, all of them. And I'm not saying that the Black Lives Matter movement is totally astroturf. The Black Lives Matter movement is a massive grassroots movement 
and the majority of people who have participated in it are working class people. But the self-appointed so-called leaders who work for the Ford Foundation and other big foundations, or rather work for foundations that work for big groups that are funded by the Ford Foundation, in the case of the three so-called founders of Black Lives Matter, I mean, these are the people who are the kind of the astroturfed fake left so-called leaders who, who are created, they're part of the so-called respectable left that are created to push an, a pro-imperialist anti-communist line. And the most hilarious example of this is this guy, DeRay McKesson. I mean, just a joke. The guy who is, he always wears like this Patagonia vest and he always like tweets out this stuff of like these corporations that sponsor him and he's, he tweets out like Spotify ads and stuff. I mean, these people are mercenaries. They're political mercenaries. And of course, what happens is that when a grassroots movement emerges organically, as Black Lives Matter did happen organically, what happens is money starts pouring in to try to co-opt it. And these big foundations, which are instruments of, of the national security state and big capital, what they do is they find opportunistic mercenary leaders that they can cultivate and the New York Times and the media write op-eds and they write profiles praising DeRay McKesson as the leader of Black Lives Matter and praising all of these figures and, and saying that how great they are. And, and they were never elected. They weren't elected by working class black people and working class people in the United States. They were never appointed the head of an actual grassroots organization. Who elected, who appointed them the so-called head, the leader of these movements, these big foundations and the media. And of course, the media is a huge role, plays a huge role in this as well because while the CIA and other intelligence agencies are using these pass-throughs to fund big foundations, to fund fake left groups, they're also funding the media. And I mentioned that there are these journals like Partisan Review. So going on, the Ford Foundation was simply an extension of the government in the area of international cultural propaganda. It was closely involved in covert actions in Europe, working closely with the Marshall Plan and CIA officials on, on specific projects. And they, they predicted that there was nothing to prevent an individual from exerting as much influence through his work in a private foundation as he could through work with government. So again, understanding that this is also before neoliberalism. So they're kind of understanding that you can have a, a kind of outsourcing strategy and you can even be more, in, more effective because if you outsource your government work, there's less red tape and there's, there's, there's much less of paperwork, to a paper trail for the few journalists who want to try to investigate with a public records requests. It's much harder to track down where this money was going, which is why the, F, the CIA prefers black budget operations, right? The CIA uses heroin money in the, in the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia and Cambodia and Laos and Myanmar, and the CIA uses heroin money in Afghanistan to fund its operations, and the CIA uses cocaine money from Colombia to fund its operations, like the terrorist war on the Sandinistas and the socialists in El Salvador. Because if you have your black budget and you're doing it through the drug trade, there's no paper trail in the government and you can't, the, you can't do a public records request. Anyway, going on. So, so she talks about how during his tenure at Ford, the, a Marshall planner who was overseeing For, the Ford Foundation, Richard Bissell, often met with Alan Dulles and other CIA officials. So again, the person helping run the Ford Foundation is, is regularly meeting with the CIA. He left suddenly to join the CIA as an assistant to Alan Dulles in 1954, but not before he had st helped steer the foundation to the vanguard of Cold War thinking. He worked directly under Paul Hoffman, who became the president of the Ford Foundation, etc. going on. So one of the Ford Foundation's first post-war ventures into international cultural diplomacy was the launch of the Intercultural Publications Program under James Laughlin, the publisher of the New Direction series, which published George Orwell and Henry Miller, and was a, a revered custodian of the interests of the avant-garde. Would it surprise you to learn that George Orwell, a former British colonial officer in Burma, then known as Burma, and a, an inveterate anti-communist who went to Spain and what did he fight with? A Trotskyite unit that hated the communists and 
went to his deathbed being a hardcore anti-communist. And what did George Orwell do during World War II when even social democrats were allying with the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin? George Orwell spent almost all of World War II writing books about how evil the Soviet Union was. Not about how evil the, 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 the Nazi regime was, nope. All of his hatred was reserved for how supposedly the Soviet Union was hell incarnate. He, he, you, know, you know that meme, that, like the 80s meme, and it says, liberals hate socialists more than fascists. Well, George Orwell was a classic example of that. I mean, if he lived longer, he would have eventually become a neoconservative, 100%. Would it surprise you to learn that George Orwell, his career was cultivated and promoted by the CIA's cultural Congress, uh, the Central Cultural Cold War networks. And Laughlin, this is very important, Laughlin launched the magazine Perspectives, which was targeted, who? Not at the conservative right wing, at the non-communist left in France, England, Italy, and Germany, and published in all of those languages. Its aim was not so much to defeat the leftist intellectuals in dialectical combat as to lure them away from their positions by aesthetic and rational persuasion. Totally uh, uh, the model for the cultural Cold War and for the cultivation of the fake left. CIA money funding this group that encourages progressive, non-communist left politics and at the same time, promotes culture, promotes good writers like Henry Miller, and promotes, promotes musicians, the avant-garde. So for instance, Jackson Pollock was promoted by the, the culture, Congress of Cultural Freedom and the CIA because then the United States could say, look how progressive our artists are compared to the Soviet Union, which of course had a policy of social realism. And they considered that the abstract expressionist art that was popular in the United States was bourgeois, and they were correct, by the way. I mean, I like some of that art, but it was genuinely bourgeois. This was not working class art, even though I like it. It, it was genuinely, and it was cultivated by the CIA. I mean, come on, like, it's, it's an, obviously it was bourgeois. So anyway, the board of this group was packed with cultural cold warriors. So, I mean, this is, this is the foundation of the fake left we're talking about today. The same strategy is the exact strategy going on right now. And I would not be surprised. Of course, we don't have the documents yet, but in 20 years, I guarantee you, a lot of the big popular anti-communist, anti pro-imperialist left publications in the US and Western Europe and other countries, I would not be surprised if they are unwitting. I'm not accusing them of being witting, but being unwitting recipients of this kind of support. So Alan Dulles met with his friend David Rockefeller for lunch. Rockefeller hinted heavily that if Dulles decided to lead the agency, he could be expected to be invited to be the president of the Ford Foundation. So there you go. I mean, inviting a billionaire oligarch capitalist, David Rockefeller, inviting the, the godfather of the CIA to be the president of the Ford Foundation. The new president became John McCloy, the archetype of 20th century American power and influence. He had been American Secretary of War, president of the World Bank, surprise, surprise, an arm of US financial capital, and high commissioner of Germany. He also became chairman of the Rockefeller's Chase Manhattan Bank and chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, by the way, just a little aside, after JFK's assassination, he was on the Warren Commission. Well, what a conflict of interest there, but... Throughout, throughout, he maintained his career as a Wall Street attorney for seven big oil companies and director of numerous corporations. And he agreed to profile, co provide cover for scores of CIA agents. So, I mean, this is, his life is a great example of this overlap between, this is again, the president of the Ford Foundation, which became the main sponsor of the fake left. This is a guy who worked for the US government, worked for the World Bank, worked for Chase Manhattan Bank, worked for the Council of Foreign Relations, and was a lawyer for Wall Street. Uh, apparently, he's going to be, he, he knows what's best for the left, right? So, McCloy took a pragmatic view of the CIA's inevitable interest in the Ford Foundation. He argued that if they failed to cooperate, the CIA would simply penetrate the foundation quietly by recruiting or inserting staff at the lower levels. McCloy's answer to the program, program, problem was to create an administrative unit within the Ford Foundation specifically to deal 
with the CIA. There you go. Well, if I don't just openly work with the CIA, they're still going to penetrate and co-op this organization, so I might as well just work with them. I mean, it says so much. The Ford Foundation became officially engaged as one of those found the organizations the CIA was able to mobilize for political warfare against communism. It's our, there were so many projects, I don't have to get into. They ran, they were linked to the Chekhov Publishing House, Bill Casey's International Rescue Committee, which was also one of these groups that encouraged these immigrants to come from communist countries to Western Europe and the United States. And they also helped run the World Assembly of Youth, which was an anti-communist group that was working with social movements among the youth. And one of the, it was also one of the largest donors to the Council of Foreign Relations. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Another supporter, I mean, she's focused more on arts in this book. So the Institute of Contemporary Arts, William Bundy, a member of the CIA's Board of National Estimates. His So there's so many examples. His brother was, so I'm not going to go into all of this here. But so this guy, Frank Lindsay, who was involved with the, the Congress of Cultural Freedom, he was an OSS veteran in 1947. He wrote one of the first memos recommending that the U.S. create a cultural action force to fight the Cold War. Again, this is one of the earliest CIA supporters of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. So one of the fathers of the fake left was this OSS veteran and CIA officials, Frank Lindsay, who was responsible for setting up the stay-behind groups in Western Europe. In 1953, he joined the Ford Foundation and from there maintained close contact with his confreres in the Intelligence Committee. So this is important. Look, this is a guy who was one of the original architects of the Cold War in the CIA, and then he works with the Fa Ford Foundation, and while he is supporting fascists, former fascists, as part of the Operation Gladio Stay Behind networks in Western Europe, he's also supporting fake left groups through the Ford Foundation. So... There's a term that people use, organize your opposition. The CIA is the master of this, and the U.S. national security state. Organize your opposition. Fund the right-wing groups and the fake left groups. So there's so many other examples here. The Sunday editor of the New York Times was involved in this network. Surprise, surprise. He joined the, the Ford Foundation and closely connected to the CIA. The Rockefeller Foundation, no less than Ford, was an integral component of America's Cold War machinery. Um, there's so many examples. And who are the people involved? Of course, the Rockefellers. Henry Kissinger was one of the key figures. He His career was cultivated by the Rockefellers. And the convergence between the Rockefeller billions and the U.S. government exceeded even that of the Ford Foundation. John Foster Dulles, the brother of Ellen Dulles and U.S. Secretary of State, went from the presidency of the Rockefeller Foundation to become secretaries of state. Nelson Rackham and other central position on his foundation guaranteed a close relationship with U.S. intelligence. He had been in charge of all intelligence in Latin America when he was appointed by Eisenhower to the National Security Council in 1954. His job was to approve covert operations. That is, assassinations, coups, you, do, you, you name it. The CIA's MK Ultra Manchurian Candidate Program, often known as the, the Mind Control Research, it was also deeply involved in this, and it was assisted with grants from Rockefeller. By the way, when we're talking about MK Ultra, this was not just a program involving the military. You know, sometimes people know that there are these experiments done with drugs to try to create super soldiers and all of that. MK Ultra was part and parcel of the CIA counterinsurgency program against the left to try to destroy the left. And one person who had his his entire life destroyed by MK Ultra, potentially, or, or at least it's suspected by his family, is the famous black communist Paul Robeson, one of the most influential leaders in the civil rights movement in the United States. Although there's a reason that he's not nearly as well known as people like Martin Luther King Jr., who he was a socialist, MLK, but you know he was a social democrat and didn't didn't support armed struggle and all of that. He was anti-imperialist to an extent, but Paul Robeson was an actual Marxist-Leninist. Paul Robeson was he he spent time in the global south doing solidarity with national liberation movements. He went to the Soviet Union, and here's an interesting article from ABC. This is the Australian news broadcaster ABC, and it's from 2013 about Paul Robeson, 
And there's a part in here about the shock therapy that he was given, which is very suspicious. And his family has suspected that the CIA was involved. So I'm going to read here that... So Paul Robeson and his family headed back to London. Once there, Robeson relapsed and was placed in a psychiatric hospital called the Priory. The treatment was extreme. Big Paul received 54 doses of electroshock therapy during the two years he was there. Paul Jr., his son, is on record saying he believes the treatment his father received there was part of the MK Ultra project. He believes the CIA wanted to neutralize his father. And they did. I mean, if it was a CIA operation, they succeeded. And after that, Paul Robeson, he was never the same. After 54 doses of electroshock therapy, I mean, his brain was basically fried. And for those who are interested in more exploring this topic of Paul Robeson, Anya Parmpol did a really interesting documentary looking into this, and, and it's a very suspicious incident. And, and by the way, you know who else actually covered this story way back in 1999 is none other than Democracy Now! before they sold out. Ironically, speaking of the fake left, Democracy Now! is a, is a case study for how this big foundation money. They now have over $12 million a year in their budget, annual budget, according to recent tax records. And it's they're just flooded with foundation money. And it encourages this kind of liberal, imperialist, soft, fake left. But back in 1999, when they were still a grassroots, independent, muckraking media outlet, Democracy Now! did a really good story titled, Did the CIA Drug Paul Robeson? a look at the secret program MKUltra, and the description here notes that in the 1950s, in the midst of the Cold War, the CIA developed a highly classified psychological warfare program called MKUltra. After the Second World War, the Western intelligence community became interested in the use of mind control drugs when it was learned that Nazi scientists engaged in similar experimentation. Described as the CIA's version of the Manhattan Project, MKUltra was developed in response to rumors that the Soviets planned to plant brainwashed assassins in the White House and other citadels of Western power. And then here's the important part. Some believe that MKUltra was used to silence dissident voices in the United States. Paul Robeson Jr., the son of the singer, actor, and activist, and communist, I would add, Paul Robeson, believes that the CIA poisoned his father with the mind-altering drug BZ. He says that a doctor who treated his father had links to the CIA program. Robeson Sr. was targeted by Senator Joseph McCarthy's House Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC. In 1943, the CIA opened a file on Robeson, and between April and June of 1961, the FBI kept a status of health file on the artist, activist, and communist. So, look, MK Ultra was much deeper. We still don't even, I think we barely are scratching the surface with what we know about what the CIA was doing in MK Ultra. The, the romanticization in movies of like the hippie drug, con drug mind control LSD program, that's scratching the surface. What this is exposing is that that MK Ultra was also part of the counterinsurgency I'm talking about, talking about against the left to destroy the revolutionary anti-imperialist left and to cultivate this fake left. And it's not a surprise that as Frances Stoner Saunders talks about in her book, The Cultural Cold War, we know that the Rockefeller Foundation, one of the key conduits, one of the key pass-throughs for CIA money was helping to also fund you as a CIA Pass through front, the Rockefeller Foundation was funding MK Ultra research. And of course, the Rockefeller Foundation back then and still today has been a key institutional force funding, financing the fake left in the United States, in Western Europe, in Latin America, and many other places. So, anyway, getting back to the cultural Cold War. So, he, he ran his intelligence department during the war, Nelson Rockefeller. I mean, incredible. So OSS veterans were recruited to the Rockef Rockefeller Foundation. And then there's also the Chase Manhattan Bank Foundation, the Council of Foreign Relations. I mean, these are all, so this is the end of the chapter here. So, I mean, the reason I went into all this is because it's so important to understand what she refers to as the semi-privatization of American foreign policy. So now I'm going to talk, 
I, I'm going pretty long here, so I'm going to focus just now finally on, on what's going on now. And because a lot of these groups are beneficiaries of the Ford Foundation. So let's look today, I just want to look at some of the recent recipients of Ford Foundation grants. Now, here I'm going to get this up. This, can, this is accessible to anyone who wants to check it out. This is the Ford Foundation grants database, right? And what are some of the groups they fund today? The Ford Foundation is one of the main sponsors of so-called progressive groups. And by the way, look, the United States, $170 million of grants in, I mean, so much money. Brazil, by the way, a lot of stuff. Colombia, a lot of stuff. They've really focused on, on cultivating the fake left in Latin America. Look there, huh, China, what a surprise. So they have, and this is just, by the way, let me, let me go back further. I wanna go back to, this website is annoying. All right, let me go back to 2006 here and apply. So here we go. These are the countries they operate. The United States, so since 2006 until now, $4.58 billion of grants just from the Ford Foundation. In Mexico, 120 million. A lot of those go to the, the groups now, which I'll talk about in a bit, that are opposing the progressive president AMLO. Here in Nicaragua, they funded fake left groups against the Sandinista government. In Venezuela, they funded fake left groups. Colombia, $60 million. In Brazil, $190 million of grants. By the way, I need to stress this point. In Latin America, that is an insane amount of money in Latin America. In a lot of parts of Latin America, the average monthly income is $200 or $300 a month. Or not, sorry, it's not the average, it's the minimum wage. But in Latin America, a lot of people make a few hundred dollars a month. So $190 million in Brazil is an insane amount of money. And of course, a lot of that money goes into supporting groups that oppose the Workers' Party of Lula da Silva. Argentina, Chile, of course, you can see in Europe, France, Germany, India, China, 179 million. In Russia, although Russia kicked out the Ford Foundation. So some of the groups that they, they I mean, let me go to the big money here because we'd spend all day. So groups that receive millions of dollars here. Let's look at some of the groups here. So the Action Center on Race and the Economy Institute, the Africa America Institute, African Women's Development Fund, AIDS groups, Alliance for Open Society. I mean, there's so much stuff, but let me focus more on here, like really big money, because the ACLU, which by the way, the ACLU has its origins because what happened is that at the beginning of McCarthyism, they kicked out all the communists. They would, not, they would they not allow any of their members to be communists or to defend communists, although they would defend Nazis, by the way. So the, I mean, they do some good work, but the ACLU kicked out all the, today, but they, they kicked out all of the communists, and a lot of the communist lawyers became what was called the CCR in the United States. And the Brennan Center for Justice, I mean, there's so much stuff here. The Center for Popular Democracy, the Center for Reproductive Rights, these are not Color of Change, Education, Demos, which is like a major democratic think tank, Equal Justice Initiative. I mean, look, the Foundation for Global Human Rights, these are not like hardcore right-wing groups. These are all supporting sexual and reproductive health, anti-racism, civil rights, legal resource, immigrant legal resource. I mean, these are not like hardcore right-wing groups. The main beneficiaries of Ford Foundation funds are the N NAACP, I mean, there's so many groups. I can spend, I'm not gonna spend much more. I mean, a lot of, I mentioned a lot of Black Lives Matter found, linked foundations, a lot of feminist groups. And that's not to say that like, again, that feminism is bad and all. No, of course we should support feminism, but a lot of these NGOs are totally astroturfed. I could equally go through and look at the grants from the Rockefeller Foundation. But now I wanna wrap up and talk about Another example, this is an article I've been working on actually. So it's not published yet, but it has some incredible research in here looking into the support for the fake left. And this is looking at Latin America. So this is just a, a draft of an article I'm working on. It's not published yet. And it talks about how in Mexico, 
the progressive government of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, AMLO, has been creating this thing called the, the Tre Maya, which is in Mexico, the south, southern part of the country is very underdeveloped. It's one of the, it's the poorest part of the country. And AMLO, who's a progressive, and he comes from the south, he's the first president from the south in decades, he has created this program to build infrastructure to develop the South. And what, what's, what was disclosed is that some of the groups in Mexico, the fake left groups organizing against his infrastructure projects. Also, by the way, he has this major oil, oil rig called Dos Bocas. Dos Bocas is a major infrastructure project that is going to because AMLO is trying to renationalize the oil, which was partially privatized under his neoliberal predecessor, Enrique Peña Nieto of the PRI party. And he's, he's, he recently passed a hydrocarbons law that will allow the government to renationalize all natural resources and use the oil to fu help fund social programs for the country. And he has another project called Dos Bocas. And what, what, what was disclosed is that the US NED, which plays the same role as the Ford Foundation and the US and USAID, their CIA fronts, they've been funding fake so-called environmental opposition to these projects in Mexico. I mean, there are so many examples of the same thing, of the, the, them supporting fake left groups in Venezuela, in, uh, in Bolivia, and this is actually why Evo Morales kicked, he actually kicked USAID and the NED out of Bolivia in 2013, and then in 2014, Rafael Correa kicked the USAID out of Ecuador. And I actually just published an article about this called How the U.S. Government Cultivated Environmental and Indigenous Groups to Defeat Ecuador's Leftist Correista Movement. And you can see USAID there in the image. I also did a very long talk about this recently. So anyone, I didn't want to just do the same talk again for you all. So anyone who's interested in looking at the case of Ecuador, you can go find, I posted it as a podcast. So you can go listen to that talk I did there. But this is looking at Mexico. So what happens is that there are these fake environmental groups, these fake left groups that have been opposing him. By the way, one of the main groups that are opposing the, the AMLO administration in Mexico is a fake, they're fake feminist groups. Because ironically, the mayor of Mexico City is herself a feminist, Claudia Scheinbaum, and she is from the Morena party, the left-wing party of AMLO. And some of the main opposition to her and to his government has been feminist groups, many of which are kind of anarchist feminist groups and other feminist groups which have received funding from the Ford Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation, from the Open Society Foundation. So, I mean, we see the same kind of fake left. But anyway, I want to go down to, um, it was exposed that the U.S. government has funded opposition to the, the Tre Maya, the Maya train project. Ironically, this is actually exposed by the AMLO administration, which is becoming, they become really you know, really ballsy, just like openly saying the U.S. government is funding the opposition against us. And, and they posted this stuff looking at some of the, the they, they found a group of 24 so-called environmental groups, a few indigenous groups, even though AMLO got support from indigenous communities in the area of southern Mexico where he's building the group. But, and he actually did it, he went to south, southern Mexico and he did it in an indigenous ritual with indigenous communities there and dressed with the traditional indigenous clothing and got their approval for the, tr the Tre Maya. But of course, what happens is that the, you, any, any empire, the European empires and the US empire today has a long history of divide and conquer, of cultivating opportunistic right-leaning indigenous leaders against progressive left-wing movements. We see the same thing in Ecuador. In, here in Nicaragua, the, the CIA supported the Mesquito community to try to undermine the Sandinistas and to support the Contra death squads. Anyway, so who are the groups funding the, op, the fake left opposition to AMLO against his, his ambitious infrastructure projects? I forgot to mention, by the way, another huge part of this. Who is helping to build these infrastructure projects in Mexico? It's being done with a, a mixture of private investment and public funding. Ding, ding, ding! A state-owned Chinese company. There you go. I mean, this gets us into the new Cold War and how the fake left is helping to support this new Cold War, saying China is this evil country committing genocide. And, and I mentioned how at the Gray Zone, we've done a lot of work showing into how a lot of these Uyghur 
secessionist groups are openly supported by the NED. In fact, the, the, I'll find a, a tweet that the NED itself tweeted boasting of supporting Uyghur separatist groups, in, and, they, and they posted this map, and the map has the part of Xinjiang province, which is like a, it has its own map, and it's, it's, it's like a, this blue map, and it's like a separatist region that they're recognizing as so-called East Turkestan. So it, it just lets the cat out of the bag. But in the case of Mexico, AMLO is helping to build these ambitious infrastructure projects with Chinese state-owned companies. And who is funding the opposition? Ding, ding, ding. The US NED, the National Endowment for Democracy, along with the Ford Foundation. We were talking about the Ford Foundation. The Rockabell Rockefeller Brothers Fund. There you go. Climate Works, a fake greenwashing astroturfed environmental group, and the Kellogg Foundation. I'll get to the Kellogg Foundation in a second. So this is naming some of the groups that work with like the OAS and some of these groups that are undermining AMLO and et cetera, the Ford Foundation. And I talk about, you know, the Ford Foundation, which I mentioned. Um, but uh, what I didn't mention is that this is documented in a brilliant book by one of the best journalists in the United States, William Bloom. He just passed away a few years ago in his book called Killing Hope, U.S. Military and CIA Interventions. He talks in his book about how the Ford Foundation worked with the CIA to fund destabilization operations in the former communist government in East Germany, and they, they funded violent operations to sabotage infrastructure to... Uh, I actually want to read this really quickly because it's, it shows how... The Ford Foundation is, I mean, like, while well, they're funding, you know, they're funding, like, anti-racist groups and feminist groups. Meanwhile, this is from William Blum's book. It's talking about how an East Berlin news magazine published a copy of a letter, letter from the Ford Foundation confirming a grant of $150,000 to the National Committee for a Free Europe so it in turn could be used as humanitarian activities to fight of the fighting group against inhumanity. This is a CIA front, of course, that ran Radio Free Europe. And what were they doing? The Association of Political Refugees from the East, the Investigating Committee of Free-Minded Jurists of the Soviet Zone, I mean, these are the names that they have. They were groups involved. And these groups were not just nonviolent, they were violent operations they were involved with. So these included explosives, arson, short-circuiting, and other methods to damage power stations, shipyards, a dam, canals, docks, public buildings, gas stations, shops, a radio station, stands, and public transportation in East Germany. So they're carrying out acts of terrorism against public infrastructure against East Germany. And then they say, look, communism is fails, socialism fails, they can't even run public transportation while we bomb it. Like the CIA with the, the Contras, they, they actually put bombs, they put mines in the port here in Nicaragua, which is a, a crime, a war crime against international law. They derailed freight trains, injuring workers, burned 12 cars of a freight train, and destroyed air pressure hoses of others, blew up road and railway bridges, placed explosives on a railway bridge of the Berlin-Moscow line, Hundreds could have been killed, but fortunately they were discovered in time. They used acids to damage vital factory machinery, put sand in the turbines of a factory. They brought it to a, bring it to a standstill, set fire to tile producing factories, promoted work slowdowns in factories, stole blueprints and samples of new developments. They killed 7,000 cows of a dairy co-op by poisoning the wax coating of a wire used to bale their corn fodder. They, I mean, I can't even see this stuff right here. They set off stink bombs because of the thing at the top here, but let's see if I can, no, it doesn't matter, whatever. Uh, they floated balloons in, that burst in the air, scattering thousands of propaganda pamphlets in East Germany. They were in possession of large quantities of poison with which it was planned to poison cigarettes to kill East Germans. They attempted to disrupt the World Youth Festival in East Berlin, but, which was a communist, by sending out forged invitations, false promises of free bed and board, false notices of, of whatever, tire puncturing equipment, setting fire to a, to a bridge. They forged and distributed large quantities of food ration card cards. And they sent out forged tax notices, 
I mean, this is terrorism. And who helped fund these operations? Not only the CIA, the Ford Foundation. So meanwhile, here in Mexico, they're funding the fake left opposition to AMLO. And I mentioned that one of the, the groups funding the fake left opposition to AMLO is the Kellogg Foundation. I was doing research on this, and honestly, as a journalist investigating this stuff, I was frankly surprised at how easy it was to find CIA connections. Usually the CIA connections are a little more hidden, but in the case of the Kellogg Foundation, which is one of the largest foundations in the world, it has $7 billion in its endowment. It's a lot of money. And when I say in its endowment, that means that it's also investing that money. So these foundations invest the money and they get return on their investment and then they invest that in other groups. So it's not like they're, they have $7 billion and they spend that $7 billion on, foundation, on grants for other groups and they run out of money. No, they're investing it and continuing to run to get more and more money to, fake, to fund the fake left. And it was, a, it was, by the way, it was founded by this extremely weird billionaire oligarch W.K. Kellogg, who was a religious fanatic and an avowed racist who funded eugenics programs. In 2019, the Kellogg Foundation announced that it had appointed Rob Gray as Director of Policy Advocacy. I was looking through its press releases, and I was honestly surprised to see how blatant they were boasting in its press release. Early in his career, their new Director of po Policy Advocacy was an intelligence analyst for the CIA, accountable for military, political, economic, and humanitarian issues in Latin America. Military issues in Latin America with the CIA? I mean, come on, like, this is the guy who's the head of policy advocacy for the Kellogg Foundation funding fake left groups. So, I mean, come on, like, to me, it's just like, they're not, they're, they've, they've gotten actually less good at hiding it. I mean, they still hide it, but like, it's, it's really incredible. And ironically, this, is, this has become a major scandal in Mexico looking at, there's so many examples of the fake left supported by these networks in Latin America, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Bolivia. These fake left groups played a key role in the 2019 coup against Evo Morales. There was this group called Rios de Pie, and there were even environmental groups you might have heard of called Extinction Rebellion. And Extinction Rebellion, I, I don't think that in any way that they are knowingly involved with intelligence. I think that they were unwittingly, they were, they were confused, and they were tricked into Extinction Rebellion. They organized protests outside the Bolivian embassy just a few weeks before the U.S.-backed coup against Evo Morales, led by far-right, fascist, racist, Christian extremists who are very violent and massacred indigenous people. So a few weeks before the coup, Extinction Rebellion in the U.S. and the U.K. had protests against the Bolivian government outside the Bolivian embassy claiming that Evo Morales was supposedly guilty of the fires in the Amazon, which were largely caused by the fascistic president of, Boliv of, of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, who, who called himself Captain Chainsaw and encouraged companies, these large corporations, to destroy the rainforest and set forests on fire. Well, meanwhile, just as there was this fake left opposition to Evo Morales or fake left opposition to Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela or the fake left opposition who participated in the coup attempt against the Sandinistas and President, uh, President Daniel Ortega here in Nicaragua. Similarly, in Mexico, we're seeing the beginning of the stages of this new fake left and the government of AMLO, just they recently, a few days ago, in the daily press briefing in the morning, they called them Mañanera, uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, the president, he had this meeting in which he said that one of the main right-wing groups funding opposition to him, which is, uh, which is this fake NGO called Mexicanos Contra la Corrupción, Mexicans Against the Corruption, who are the main groups that fund it? There you go. The National Endowment for Democracy, created by the CIA under the Ronald Reagan administration, USAID, a front for the CIA that was used by the CIA to fund the Contra Death Squads in Nicaragua. By the way, Elliot Abrams, the war criminal who helped oversee genocide in Guatemala, who also helped oversee the Contras in Nicaragua, who carried out acts of terrorism, 
Elliot Abrams used so-called humanitarian aid flights to smuggle weapons to the Contras. So USAID is an arm of the CIA. It played a key role in the, coup, the violent coup attempt on February 23rd, 2019 against the elected Chavista government in Venezuela, where USAID tried to force violently fake aid across the border with Colombia with the help of the military, by the way. Uh, the US military was involved in the operation and the Colombian military. And USAID funded that operation. So, by the way, who else is funding this, this main right-wing opposition group to AMLO Mexico? The Ford Foundation. What a coincidence. There you go. And this group is, is run by a wealthy Mexican oligarch named Claudio X. Gonzalez. And he helps lead this group called Si por México, which is an opposition, which is an alliance of the neoliberal opposition to AMLO. And by the way, I should say, Si por México, the reason I say that they're very similar to Pinochet is because this is the, uh, this is the image that they're using, Si por México. It, it's almost an exact repetition of what Pinochet uses, used when the Chilean fascist dictator when there was a referendum on, on whether or not to keep the, the Pinochet regime. Uh, and it, there was Si. So, I mean, like, and by the way, si, this is a very hilarious point. Si por México includes an alliance of three of the major political parties in Mexico that have dominated Mexican politics for decades, which is the PRI party, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, which has its origins in the Mexican Revolution but has become neoliberal, the PAN party, the National Action Party, the explicitly right-wing conservative party, and the PRD, the uh, kind of social democratic kind of fake left party, and those three parties unified in an alliance. The three main neoliberal parties that have dominated Mexican politics for like 80 years formed an alliance to tr against the brand new left-wing party created by, More by AMLO a few years ago called Morena. And they're part of the Si por México alliance with the right-wing oligarchs trying to undermine and overthrow AMLO and their strategy, as I, exp as I showed in an article, the there's this thing called the Bloque Opositor Amplio in Mexico, uh, which is like the wide opposition alliance, the broad opposition bloc in Mexico. And, and they, I wrote this article about it here that you can find where, let me see, Alliance Mexico, I didn't have this up before here, where, sorry. Mexico Alliance Gray Zone. I'm just gonna get this article up because it's an example of everything. Here we go. So, leaked documents reveal right-wing oligarch plot to overthrow Mexico's AMLO, and it's part of this thing called BOA, and it has this document here. It was called Rescatamos a Mexico. We're gonna save Mexico, and they name that they have they have lobbyists in Washington working on their behalf, working with the White House and the Capitol, and they also say that they have. Another part of here, they have a bunch of media outlets they name who are supporting them, and they also name the, 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 the governors of states who are working with them, and former presidents Vicente Fox and Felipe Calderón, the former right-wing presidents, and then they name these parties, including the fake left party, the PRD, and the PAN and the PRI, and they say that they have, they have um, Anti-AMLO, the, the 4T means the fourth transformation, which is like the, the progressive transformation that AMLO is running that he says is going to end neoliberalism. And they also have, they have the backing of investment funds on Wall Street. And they say that they have foreign correspondents in Mexico and the foreign press in the United States and Europe. So, I mean, that's, I mean, I've talked a lot about my other talks about Ecuador. I could have spent so much time talking about it. I've talked about here in Nicaragua, we have a, a lot of articles at the gray zone looking at how the National Endowment for Democracy was used in Nicaragua in the 2018 coup attempt, and it funded a lot of these fake left groups, which helped carry out a very violent coup attempt against the democratically elected socialist government here of the Sandinistas. My colleague Max Blumenthal wrote this, U.S. government meddling machine boasts of laying the groundwork for insurrection in Nicaragua, and it goes to looking at the National Endowment for Democracy. The advantage of the NED 
is that the NED has a grants data database, which you can find actually they, they pretend to be transparent and you can go through here and you can look at the projects in Venezuela, which is a main target of the fake left, right? So you can look at, they're promoting innovative solutions, i.e. neoliberal economic programs, electoral participation to rig the vote against the, Sandinista, uh, against the Chavistas, dialogue and reconciliation to weaken, Ven weaken Venezuela's uh, diplomatic influence in other countries, raising awareness about human rights, weaponizing fake human rights groups against Venezuela, democratic governments, I mean, more of this fake stuff, citizen participation, I mean, leadership, reforms, checks and balances. I mean, this is all promoting the fake left and all these groups. Here in Nicaragua, it's the same thing. Although this past year, the Nicaraguan government, the, the elected parliament here, the National Assembly, passed a law, a foreign agents law that makes it, you have to register as a foreign agent if you're an NGO, a so-called NGO that receives funding from foreign governments. So the same thing, promoting, oh, this is for, no, I want to I do it for Nicaragua. This is still in Venezuela. Here we go. Promoting human rights, access to justice and human rights, youth civic engagement, raising the voice of women entrepreneurs, social movements in defense of democracy. I mean, democratic space, women as political actors. I mean, these are the groups that the NED, which is a CIA front, is supporting. The role of women in defense of Nicaraguan democracy. You can look at any country and they do the same thing. By the way, Myanmar right now, in Myanmar, there's so much of this involved. But with, if, with that, I've been speaking way too long. I mean, we can, in the comments, we, in the questions, we can talk about other case studies like Ecuador, Venezuela, Bolivia. I mean, those are my specialties, uh, my specialty, my uh, things, the things I focus on. But, you know, there are so many other countries where you could look at the same kind of fake left. Uh, in, in the case of China, you know, I, the last thing I'll push here before going to the Q&A is that I, I did this article about how the NED, this CIA front from the U.S. government, has funded the they, they funded the so, so multiple speakers at the the socialist conference, which is it used to be organized by this group in the United States called the the International Socialist Organization, the ISO, and it called the Socialism Conference. And now it used to be run by the ISO, which used the symbol. The ISO voted to dissolve, and now they, they merged into Democratic Socialists of America, and now DSA, Jacobin Magazine, and Haymarket Books, which is, Haymarket Books is the old arm, publishing arm of the ISO. The ISO specifically is an old school Cliffite organization, or it was rather, which comes from Tony Cliff, who was a trot, who was extremely anti-communist and very pro-imperialist. I mean, there were some Trotskyites, to be fair, who supported the Cuban Revolution and supported the Vietnamese National Liberation Front. The Cliffites were strongly against the Vietnamese National Liberation Front and strongly against the Cuban Revolution, and they basically support every prerogative of imperialism. And I talked about in this article how at the Socialism Conference, there were multiple speakers demonizing how evil China is and the talk was China and the U.S., inter-imperial rivalry or class struggle and solidarity. And of course, the entire talk was about how evil China is and how it's all state capitalist, but also Stalinist at the same time somehow. And they're, they're committing genocide and violating the, the rights of all these people and they're so evil and blah, blah, blah. And they had multiple speakers funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. If you go to the NED website, you can see Ronald Reagan's right at the top, and they talk about how they were created to, su to support trade unions and free markets. And when they say trade unions, they mean the, the Polish anti-communist trade union Solidarity, which, which is a CIA-funded union that was used to overthrow the Polish People's Republic, which is another classic example of the fake left being directly supported by the CIA. And then another example is the, the AFL-CIO, jokingly called the AFL-CIA in the United States, which is one of the biggest trade federations in the United States, has a long history of working with the CIA and the National Endowment for Democracy to support anti-communist unions in other countries. And the AFL-CIO has a group, something called the Solidarity Center, which is funded directly by the National Endowment for Democracy. 
and the Solidarity Center funds fake, like, fake labor unions in places like Venezuela and other countries right here. National Endowment for Democracy and Solidarity Center welcome increased funding from Congress. Another part, key part of the fake left, you can see right here on the NED website. So anyway, but getting back to, oh man, getting back to this. So I talk about how there is this group called China Labor Watch. And as we go forward with the new Cold War, China, there's going to be a lot of this new fake left talking about how evil China is. And again, it's not to say that like China is some perfect country. That's like bourgeois idealism. No country in the world is perfect. Of course, they have a lot of contradictions and problems and things that they're working on. I'm not saying that there's some perfect paradise. But as we move forward, the contradictions in Chinese society are going to be exploited and these fake left groups are going to say that we're, we are in solidarity with the Chinese working class against the Communist Party of China. And there are these groups like China Labor Watch, which is funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. It's not based in China. It's based in, the, in New York, in the United States. There's also this group, the International Labor Rights Forum, which is based in, the, in Washington, D.C., and is also funded by the NED. And... There's also things like the Made in China Journal, which focuses on labor rights in China. You might have seen it. And who, who publishes it? The European Union's Horizon 2020, which is a neoliberal business program to support European business investment abroad. It's described as the financial instrument implementing the Innovation Union, a, a neoliberal Europe 2020 flagship initiative aimed at securing Europe, Europe's global competitiveness. So... It's not just the United States. The European Union has these groups. The European Union also has something called the European Endowment for Democracy, which is explicitly modeled after the U.S. National Endowment for Democracy. And they're funding these groups that focus on labor rights in China to try to win over support from the fake left and say, well, if you're on the left and you care about workers' rights and you're a socialist, you have to oppose China and the Communist Party of China. Other China-related NED grants, including the Network of Chinese Human Rights Defenders, Human Rights in China, China Aid, China Change, China Rights in Action, and a New York group called the Chinese Feminist Collective, which sounds like some great grassroots group. It's funded by the U.S. government regime change arm, the NED. China Labor Bulletin, which has been repeatedly, which has been repeatedly named in things like Jacobin Magazine, Socialist Worker, which is the arm of the old arm of the ISO, and other Trotskyite groups, they will quote the China Labor Bulletin, which because it has a map of so-called strikes, it's very dubious. They do the kind of thing that like the like Uyghur, uh, Uyghur, uh, U.S. funded like Uyghur insurgents and separatists do will like or like North Korean. Um, immigrants will do like these these like these people who leave and they go over to South Korea because they're paid hundreds of thousands of dollars and they make up these fake stories about how like Kim Jong Un personally fed my brother to a pack of of rabies dogs with rabies like these insanely fake stories and then like all of their stories change over time which we've seen with some of these people these Uyghurs who claim to be in concentration camps well anyway so just as they are, they, you know, they use these personal stories as so-called proof of, of this, the China Labor Bulletin has a, a map of so-called strikes based on like some random person in China says they have a strike. So they have this map. And then that in turn is, is quoted by left-wing websites and its slogan is supporting the workers' movement in China. But as I point out, it's not based in mainland China. It's actually based in Hong Kong. And actually, I think it's probably going to move or close down soon because of China's new national security law. And it's funded by the U.S. government. So anyway, as the new Cold War moves on, there are so many different countries we could look at where this fake left is being supported. But the reason I, I went into looking at the, the, the book, The Cultural Cold War, and the NED website, and my reporting, and other things is because... When we're talking about the fake left, it's not just ideological. You know, as someone who, as people who want to have a materialist Marxist analysis of history, we can't, we, we don't want this like Kantian idealist battle of ideas and, and or, or like this neoliberal idea where they say like, it's the marketplace of ideas and the best, the best idea wins. No, that's ridiculous bourgeois idealism. The reason certain ideas 
win, so-called win and become prominent. It's called ideology. The reason there are certain ideologies that are hegemonic is because they are backed by capital, by material force. And in the case of the fake left, there has been a fake left cultivated, a pro-imperialist left cultivated that's anti-communist since the beginning of the first Cold War, going back to the late 1940s, as I spelled out historically here, and still today, the institutional apparatus constructed during the first Cold War through these foundations and these NGOs and these other cultural Cold War groups, they continue to fund these anti-communist, pro-imperialist, fake left groups. And as we move into the new Cold War, they are going to continue those same operations. And it's going to be crucial to understand the new propaganda in Cold War 2.0 in order to dispel it. It's going to be crucial to understand how that propaganda apparatus works. Thanks so much for inviting me. Well, that was the end of my talk on the CIA counterinsurgency, the cultural Cold War, and the first Cold War, and how these same strategies are being used to astroturf a fake pro-imperialist left in the new Cold War. There actually is a second part, if you can believe it or not, as much as I blabbered in this talk, there's a second part, and I decided, it, we did a Q&A session that went pretty long, but I thought it was very interesting. There were a lot of good questions and good conversation. There was, a, a, there was back and forth. There were people criticizing China, and we had a, you know, a good debate. It wasn't just one-sided. So I would highly recommend checking out part two, talking more about the kind of CIA operations and that are still going on, and just in general, how these billionaire oligarchs in the United States and in other countries are committed not only to fighting socialism through forces abroad, through military force, but they're also continuing to fund a sophisticated cultural and civil apparatus of civil society organizations to undermine the left at home and abroad. I mean, they do it abroad. Why wouldn't they do it at home? It's, it's not just happening in Venezuela and Cuba and Chile and so many countries. So if you want to support the work we do here at Moderate Rebels, please consider going to patreon.com slash moderate rebels. And thanks for listening. We'll see you in part two. See you next time.